Hello and welcome to the LLG Grapevine podcast. You're listening to Helen McGrath, Head of Public Affairs, and I'm delighted to be joined by Deborah Evans, LLG CEO. Welcome, Deborah. Well, hello, Helen, and my goodness, what a week it's been. Um, so how about you tell me about it then? Well, in a week where the Prime Minister has disbanded the Home Energy Efficiency Task Force, announced potential major reform to A-levels in England, and parental attitudes to full-time attendance at school post-COVID, pointing to a looming crisis. Deborah, I thought instead we take a walk through the local government news we feel merits discussion. So what's caught your attention? Well, do you know, I've got a growing interest in housing disrepair because of the huge, huge costs of it. And of particular interest to me is that the costs of housing disrepair aren't necessarily the costs of repairing the properties. The majority of those costs come from legal costs from the, the other side's um, expenses and obviously compensation for the claimant. So actually a huge amount of the housing budget is then being spent on things other than repairing the housing stock. And you then end up in this um, very difficult circle, this downward spiral, um, where there's then less money available Available to spend on repairing stock because of the amount that's being spent on disrepair claims. And I wonder if there is another way to do this. Now, in a, a previous career of mine, I used to work in, in personal injury and clinical negligence. And in those sort of scenarios, portals have been created where claimants could literally sort of log on um, and lodge details of their claim very much in a low cost environment. So they would still get the repair done, they'd get compensation, um, but it was able to really get those legal costs under control. So you still had justice, you still had the system working, but actually the, the majority of the, the money was then not being spent on, on legal costs. Um, and I think that there's potentially a way forward for housing disrepair to either look at, um, at protocols, portals, different ways of doing things that will really keep the costs under control. Um, so if anybody is interested in perhaps exploring some ideas around this, please do get in touch. Um, one of the things we need to do here is think, could there be a different future? So from housing disrepair now to another shoddy state of affairs, Helen. Well, quite. Now, Dennis and I have covered the post office inquiry over the last two weeks and recent news coverage has centred around the £600,000 settlement payment offered to those post office operators wrongly accused and prosecuted for theft, fraud and false accounting. Now, some commentators have called the events with Horizon the most widespread miscarriage of justice in UK history. And frankly, it's pretty hard to find an argument against that. It's absolutely shocking. Now, before we turn to the specifics of phase four of the inquiry, what you might not have been aware of is that last month, Nick Reed, the chief executive of the post office, said he would return a bonus of 54,000 linked to the inquiry into the scandal. It turns out that executives were paid significant bonus payments in relation to work they carried out in relation to the inquiry because, wait for it, the progress of the Horizon inquiry was one of four metrics on which bonus payments were awarded. So phase four of the inquiry is examining action against sub postmasters and others, policy making, audits and investigations, civil and criminal proceedings, knowledge of and responsibility for failures in investigation and disclosure. And as a lawyer, this part of the inquiry is particularly interesting, especially the area of disclosure, which, um, as we all know, can be a very contentious issue with allegations here that documentation damaging to the post office's position were not so disclosed. The findings in this phase, with its potential to impact rule of law and ethics guidance, will be of re particular relevance to us all. I'm following the written transcript, but you can watch the recorded proceedings on demand. And I've taken a particular liking to Sir Wynne Williams. Anyone who starts a question with, you mean to tell me, certainly has my vote. Now, in other news, the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman has released a report with surprising findings on complaints. Yes, thank you very much. It has indeed. So they've brought out their 2023 annual review of adult social care complaints, which really pulls together the national picture of trends and common issues. 
um, across the country. So what we're always interested in is, is there a learning opportunity and, and sort of spotting areas really where things are going wrong. Um, so it's probably no surprise that the cases that they see involve well-established concerns, things such as um, timely and proper assessment and care planning, issues around charging for care and the provision of support. And they've done some particular high-profile investigations into the inadequacy of 15-minute home care calls. So that's definitely one to watch there. Um, now, they're, they're also very um, widespread in that they look at all adult social care providers, whether the care has been arranged and funded privately um, or funded by the, uh, the local council. So they're looking at both sides. And there really is a difference between the way that the two sides work. Now, they've noted a bit of a surge in complaints that they're investigating and upholding, particularly from an uphold perspective. Now, a long, long time ago, we're looking nearly 10 years ago in 2014, they only used to actually uphold about 46% 40 of what they investigated. Now it's in the region of 75%. So that's a massive increase in the number of cases that are upheld. Um, but one of the things that they were concerned about is actually numbers haven't increased. They had a fall in complaints last year and actually it's very similar this year and they think that that's potentially an issue around signposting. Um, particularly they're worried about signposting for people who are funding their own care and they obviously receive fewer complaints from private funders than they'd expect because they actually have quite a wide share of the market. So back to the fact that they think the signposting needs to be better. Um, so that's perhaps something that you'd be able to assist them with. But do have a look at some of the detail within that report to see if any of it could offer good learning for you in your council. So there are also more existential issues worrying some of our councils at present, striking at their very financial foundations straight to the heart of governance. Helen. Yes, and so we move neatly to Birmingham. So in recent developments, the council's monitoring officer has now issued a section five report in relation to the local authorities pay equity system. Now that's been issued on the basis that the council has failed to secure a decision relating to the implementation of a job evaluation scheme, calling for immediate steps to be taken to secure a robust pay system. And this would include ob objective application of the Equality Act, uh, to remove any potential future legal action. Uh, but it doesn't stop there because the council is also facing the issue of no proposed way forward to resolve its current equal pay challenges, or indeed a methodology to limit the accrual of additional liability past the 1st of April 2025. So in consequence, their 151 officer has issued a second 114 report, which damningly states, and I'm going to quote here, that since the liability will now continue to accrue, it is my opinion that the council is now a accruing additional unlawful expenditure in the form of a growing liability and B makes a decision by omitting a decision that will result in a loss or deficiency for the council and council tax payers. So further problems uh, for Birmingham have also come to light. Its financial statement for 22-23 is unable to be signed off by the external auditors due to reports that the council's IT system has so many problems that it's unable to produce accounts detailing, detailing its financial status. So a lot going on for Birmingham at the moment. Um, meanwhile, in Slough, commissioners have issued a third report detailing the progress of the intervention at Slough Borough Council to Minister Lee Rowley. Now, the executive uh, summary states that whilst the council is now demonstrating commitment to improvement and is working hard to the aim, the scale of the problems that need to be addressed are such that more demonstrable and sustained improvement is now required before commissioners can consider any reduction in the scale of intervention. That said, I think it's important here to acknowledge the successes which are stated in the report. So what, what can it tell us? The, the scrutiny of decisions has improved. There's now a stable top team at the corporate leadership level with permanent statutory officers and the council delivered a slight underspend for the 22-23 financial year and has a balanced, balanced budget for 23-24. So not out of the woods, but definitely going in the right direction. Deborah, governance is such a huge area of concern at the moment, borne out by these increasing interventions. 
Tell us about how LLG is supporting our members. Well, indeed, it can be a very lonely place to be if you're in an authority that's um, currently in the middle of an intervention. And we do understand that. Um, and unfortunately, there the seem to be new names announced uh, you know, literally every few months. Uh, but the LLG Governance Conference actually could provide an outlet for you. If you're either worried that your council may be on a future list or potentially you're in that situation, there is nothing better than taking a little bit of time out um, to reflect, to get some peer support, network with other people who may have been in the same position and actually listen to some really good guidance, recommendations and thoughts around things such as Section 114, Section 5, public interest reports, etc. So uh, our governance conference in uh, November is in Sheffield and what we're aiming to do is to cover a number of these tricky uh, issues and really show not just what to do when you're in them but what to do before you end up in that position and how it is really absolutely possible for a council to move forward build learn and come out better helen was just saying about slough how they've obviously turned a corner and they're not out of the woods but we can tell you how to do that um, so do come along. We have people talking about the Sheffield Trees Inquiry, about lessons learned from how they handled that, but also how the council is now in a much better place because it's rebuilt those connections with the community and it feels it understands it better. Um, we have people talking in detail about culture and how that impacts on things like public interest reports and poor performance and how you can get a really positive culture within your um, local authority. Um, um, and also understanding that really strong management of finance and that is all about working closely then with a the section 151 officer um, that's what really can then lead to success but it's all about as we know having monitoring officers and lawyers in the room when those conversations are being discussed nobody fails overnight failure takes years and years so if you want to be in the best position you can be i would encourage you to come along to our governance conference so i think bearing that in mind i'm going to pass back to Helen. Thank you, Deborah. Well, I've previously reported in the podcast on the government's intention to remove the nutrient neutrality rules within the levelling up and regeneration bill. This was done by way of amendment, which the House of Lords blocked in a debate on the 13th of September. Now, of consequence here is the fact that the government will not be able to reintroduce the amendment because the bill was in fact at the report stage at the time it was considered. So this means that if the government wants to move forward on removing provision, it will need to bring in fresh legislation to do so. And with limited parliamentary time and rumblings of an election, the question I'm asking is whether they have the time to do so. Despite that, the government's been clear that it remains committed to scrapping nutrient neutrality rules, stating nutrient neutrality the delays it is causing to housing delivery and the wider need to restore our waterways remains a government priority and the government will make further announcements about next steps in due course. Others, of course, Deborah, take a very different view on the impact of removing the rules on the environment. So the levelling up and regeneration bill is currently awaiting its third reading before it moves to final stages in the House of Lords. It's anticipated that the government will seek to secure royal assent before the King's speech on the 7th of November, 2023. It certainly feels like this bill has been rumbling along for ages. So my question really here is, what will that mean in consequence for a remote meeting provision for local authorities within England? Will that actually and finally be made into law? Are we actually on the precipice of a campaign that's been waging for over three years? Deborah, could I actually be popping champagne corks with John Austin from ADSO at the governance conference? A girl can only dream. Now, as Deborah mentioned previously, the governance conference is being held in November in Sheffield, the 10th of November to be precise, but we won't be getting there by HS2 anytime soon, Deborah. 
Uh, yes, indeed, with the news that uh, HS2 may indeed be scrapped uh, north of Birmingham after the costs are spiralling out of control. But what does this mean for local authorities that were expecting HS2 through their area? What does it mean for local authorities that have already seen swathes of land, often greenbelt, um, being destroyed, dug up, um, large amounts of concrete, bridges being built um, for a train system that may now not move in their direction. What does this mean for the long-term environmental goals that it was due to deliver? So I think there's a lot of questions to be asked here from a local authority perspective. And that's something that you're going to need to be thinking about over the next few weeks as this news materializes. So coming soon, but one to watch, I think. Um, so, on that uh, depressing note, uh, I'm going to pass you back to Helen. Well, you've, you've, you've stolen my tagline there, Deborah. So, on that note, it, it falls only to thank Deborah for joining me today and taking time out of a busy schedule. Always a delight to hear what it is you've got to say on the sector. And of course, you can read more on the items discussed today and many more besides by going to bulletin number 34, available on the LLG website now. So, until then, it's goodbye from me. And it's most definitely goodbye from me. Thank you so much.